Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between New Art School and Design Deduct Podcast. Our guest today is Andrew Brewerton. Welcome, Andrew. Hi. Fantastic to have you here. Tell us about you and your work. Well, my new work is, uh, I guess, entering uh, a, a new phase, and uh, and that's the technical term for that is retirement. I've just stepped down after 11 years as the principal of Plymouth College of Art in, in the UK um, after something like um, 27 years in higher education, working in art schools. Um, and so the world is opening up for me in a slightly different way. I'm, I kind of don't have to carry that level of responsibility anymore. And um, I have an opportunity you know, to basically pick up some of my old interests if I can remember where I left them. Okay, okay. What are those? <laughs> well, there are still there are a series of conversations that I guess um, I've found all too little time for. Um, you know, because my job as a as a the head of an institution has you know has precluded precluded it and. Um, they have to do with people I like working with. My, my um, colleagues, for example, at the VNA Research Institute, we're working on a publication um, at the moment that I'm uh, contributing a chapter to. Um, another interesting conversation um, that's developing with Claire Toomey at the University of Westminster and Dana Cutler, uh, f- former head of uh, research and learning at Tate, um, but actually, I, I need some time to do a bit of reading and some writing. And um, I guess uh, um, family life has, has moved into a new gear with the arrival of two wonderful granddaughters uh, over the last couple of months. So, yeah, life is sweet. Fantastic. Fantastic. So tell us about uh, how you got in, into, into teaching. <clears throat> I guess um, sort of by accident, except that I I had a I started out on a, an academic career. I, I um, studied English um, literature, and when I graduated, moved to Italy, taught um, at the University of L'Aquila in Italy, in central Italy, for two years. I was appointed as a lettore, uh, a kind of English language assistant taught on their literature and language program and came back to the UK to uh, begin a a PhD, which I abandoned after a year. Um, It was a very interesting question. It was the question of metaphor in late Renaissance English and Italian poetry, Um, metaphor in terms of 17th century thinking around language as cognitive method and but I came to the conclusion I kind of wrote myself out of a job in a way uh, that my interest in in poetry was um, and my my academic interests were almost at variance and so um, I I quit the PhD after a year and got a job um, in a glass factory <clears throat> And I worked for about 10 years in the glass industry. Um, I was a uh, production manager eventually at uh, Stuart Crystal, a, a long-standing, centuries-old, uh, full lead, traditional, uh, handmade glass crystal wow. uh, company in Sourbridge. And then I moved to Dartington Crystal as head of uh, design and development. So um, it was while I was at Dartington that I reconnected with um, art schools. Uh, Dartington Crystal used to sponsor the Royal Society of Arts glassware bursary. I was on the uh, selection panel for that. I used to visit glass departments, uh, which were more numerous in those days back in the 80s than they are now. Um, And... um, Then a job came up at Wolverhampton at a point at which I suspected that the company was reducing its investment in design and development. Um, And I think what was happening was 
they, they were preparing for a management buyout. But a job came up at the University of Wolverhampton, and I was appointed as Keith Cummings' successor um, as uh, head of glass, subject leader in glass. Um, when was that? January 94, I think. Um, so that was really my reintroduction um, into higher education and uh, all of the all of the changes I've made in my checkered career have have been uh, well the last thing they've been is gradual in a sense they've always been um, quite radical or disruptive in terms of any reasonable curriculum for time. <laughs> So, so you, you you had a strong connection to craft. So. Yeah, I, I I mean I I was going to go to art school as well, um, in, but but then decided I would um, study English and and uh, and my wife, uh, my girlfriend at the time, um, was a painter, and there was a kind of sense in which I felt that maybe that that was her job. <laughs> Uh, at the time, but the the interesting um, the experience of working in glass factories was was formative um, in all sorts of ways. Um, <clears throat> you can read um, Herman Melville's Leviathan of a novel, Moby Dick, yes. um, as a sustained elegy uh, to the Nantucket whaling industry before the invention of the mechanical harpoon. It was a, it's a book that sort of embodies and um, memorialises a certain. Kind, it does all sorts of other things as well. That book. Um, it, it, but he was living through the the decline, the passing of an entire culture, and I think that's how I felt technically um, working in. A handmade crystal factory uh, on the shop floor, and and then running production. And the, the British industry at that point was um, being hollowed out. Really, uh, the market was saturated with um, handmade Eastern European imports, and increasingly, the development of machine-made crystal from Germany and Italy and France and elsewhere of increasingly higher uh, quality. So um, it was a remarkable privilege in a way. I was, I kind of served the last of us, a, a whole uh, tradition of apprenticeships in a way as fa factory managers uh, in, that, in that culture um, with generations of the same families having worked in those places and, um, so craft what craft means to me all sorts of things and um, and making um, is I, really the center of gravity of several of the conversations that I was discussing earlier. Um, making not simply as technical exercise, but making as thinking. Absolutely. So how did that uh, craft, uh, how did you connect all, all that experience to your later experience in education? Well, I, I, I guess that, <clears throat> I guess that um, what I tried to do as Dean of Art and Design um, at Wolverhampton and um, certainly as principal of Plymouth College of Art was re defend a commitment to craft and material practice um, in art schools at a time when really the, uh, if you like, the, the progression routes from school to further and higher education in terms of the crafts were, were, were becoming fewer and fewer. You know, schools just don't have ceramic workshops any longer, basically. The art room is that room with the, sink in it uh, and increasingly that room with uh, computers in it and so what we've seen is a kind of um 
you, you, ecological disaster <laughs> um, crisis in terms of the education system and the role of making um, throughout the education system. And I'm in saying in saying this, I'm not sort of dis defending a subject interest. I'm talking about the way in which the development of haptic skills and visual intelligence and material sensibility um, is increasingly uh, uh, well is less and less has been less and less valued <clears throat> by educational policymakers and curriculum drivers. Um, and there is a loss of there is a kind of deficit of uh, in human intelligence as a as a result of that. You, you know, you talk to you talk to somebody like Roger Niebone at, at UCL, uh, and he will lament uh, the loss of fundament of basic haptic skills in trainee surgeons, yeah. who just you know they weren't they weren't using scissors or or knives at school. They don't have uh, the muscle memory. Uh, they haven't built that. Uh, kind of uh, thinking uh, for years, and suddenly they are faced um, with a new kind of learning situation in, in which they're required to perform surgical operation. And I know that's a simplification, um, but the fundamental point remains valid, I believe. So the this the space of learning becomes the critical question. The space of learning offers or withdraws the possibility of learning. That's one of the propositions in a short manifesto of 10 propositions for creative learning and social justice that I wrote and we published at um, Plymouth College of Art a few years back. But without certain kinds of learning environments, you can't learn certain things. And it's absolutely clear to me that there is a kind of um, creative intelligence, aesthetic sensibility that people only, only really acquire in direct contact and, in, and engagement with materials and processes and technologies um, in which they learn by touch and they in which they learn how to use their eyes absolutely absolutely i mean and hand hard eye coordination is something that um, yeah uh, needs to be achieved in all areas of art and design yeah so you were also able to connect uh, all the challenges of higher education into the creation of a, of a school Would you like to tell us more about that yes i i when I got to Plymouth College of Art in 2010, um, I mean, I was very attracted to, to that place um, and that institution because it's, it was a, at that point in the further education sector. It was a college of further education and about 45% of its work was in higher education. So. The college was teaching uh, BTEC and extended diplomas, national diplomas, but it was also teaching um, degree level BA and a couple of master's programs. And it was my first um, hands-on experience of the FHE continuum, um, the continuum from of specialist learning in art, design, and media from eight, from the age of 16. So from 16 to 18, we had students in, or 16 to 19, we had students either on extended diplomas or doing the foundation art and design diploma. Um, and then we had students on BA programs and master's programs. But one of the most interesting um, things the college also did, but didn't, really value i guess familiarity um breeds contempt in that in that sense is 
was running a Saturday art club and had been for 10 years or more. And um, if you talk to John Sorrell, John and Francis Sorrell at Sorrell Foundation, they will tell you that Saturday Art Club was the thing that changed their lives, that, that basically it was, it's what uh, Francis calls, you know, look, looking in. It's when you get to look inside the kitchen. Um, I, I myself attended Saturday Art Club um, in ceramics uh, when I was at school. Um, the, the youngest artists, therefore, in our community at Plymouth College of Art were four years old. We, we ran Saturday Art Club from the age of four to the age of 18. Brilliant. And I know students, so Ben Lintel, who's currently working in Venezia, he's, he's a glass artist working in a glass studio in Venice. Um, his first experience um, of art and design was as a nine-year-old uh, attendee at Saturday Art Club. And he, he did pre-degree, he did his BA, he did his master's program uh, at Plymouth College of Art. And uh, no, he didn't do a master's, but he did stay on as a, a kind of technical assistant in the hot shop. Um, so, I mean, it's truly inspirational. If you're if four-year-olds have the same status in your community as a BA student or a, a lecturer or a college principal by virtue of the fact that we're all there for the same purpose and the same reason, and we're all at a different point in our, uh, our progress uh, in those terms, and it never ends, um, then you have something utterly unique. And that, that seemed to me to be a a kind of paradigm of the education system as a whole um, in the UK and the kind of complete disjuncture um, that we, we see and we experience um, in policy terms between primary and secondary and further education and higher education and the sort of crass artificial polarization of ideas about technical and academic or uh, skills and professional uh, learning. Um, and in a place like Plymouth, it's these are people's lives that we're talking about in policy terms, their potentiality, their opportunities. Um, and education is absolutely at the heart of many of the social and environmental, the big social and environmental questions of our time. So what I found was that 16 year old specialist um, art and design students coming to study an extended diploma at Plymouth College of Art, when I spoke to them would say, and I sort of be interested in how it was going and they'd say well it's different and when they were pressed to tell to describe what was different about being at art school and being at school they said well eventually um at school they just teach you how to pass exams um and here we think for ourselves then i would i'd say well that's great and they say yeah it's hard they hadn't had the formation that they needed to work in a studio environment um, and they were catching up um, you know at speed so um, what we have what we've witnessed in the UK over the last 30 years I mean two generations of in school school terms is um, it's what I think of as the hostile takeover of the education system by the assessment industry. So uh, successive uh, government administrations obsessed with um, control measures, regulation and institutional structure at the expense of curriculum. 
um, and learning. Um, and across a spectrum of a resource spectrum that varies very significantly from the private sector to the public sector. Um, and it seems to me uh, extraordinary these days that the some of the best art education, or at least the best resources you can find is in the private sector, because the private sector still values um, the curriculum and um, in these terms, um, but the control measures are a structural obstacle to schools investment in the visual arts, the performing arts and uh, basically cre creative thinking um, in the wider curriculum. So this, this the, the league table culture, um, the behavioral, uh, the iniquitous sort of behavioral uh, consequences of the, um, the target culture. Um, mean that exam grades are the way are the currency. That's that's the the transactional currency of our education system is exam grades. Um, and I think over the last couple of years, with COVID and with lockdown, we've we've seen um, just how vacuous um, that formula is. Um, suddenly, it seems you can you can trust teachers to mark exams um who'd have thought who'd have thought that um so there's a there's a kind of gaming of the system uh it's a system that's um wrapped up in itself at the expense of learners sorry i'm rant ra rambling on a little bit here but uh no this is very uh, uh, so we decided to the if we were serious about making a difference in those t in these terms, we should make a school. Um, which seemed an outrageous proposition at the time. Um, but in 2012, we applied to the DfE through the free school scheme, which was the only way you could create new schools. And the free schools initiative, when it began, was highly potential, highly uh, contentious uh, politically. Um, but there was one element of that that, that was interesting, and it, it was the idea that you could drive innovation through a different approach to building uh, learning communities in the shape of schools. A lot of these schools uh, cropped up, that cropped up in the first few waves were basically had um, religious designations or, or some subject designations. And we saw the opportunity to create a school in which making was at the heart of learning in all subjects. And in so doing to create a, a progressive continuum of creative learning in all subjects from age for from early years through formal schooling from four to 16, th through further education and higher education and into professional practice. And that was clearly a project that would take a couple of generations to mature. Um, and I guess, I guess that occupied a, a lot of my, my time, my life for a period of eight years or something. Um, the school, um two years ago trans was brokered into a multi-academy trust um and the college retains uh some uh relationship with with that school um we established the school in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the country in stonehouse um and the uh, mill bay area of plymouth it's in the top 1% of lower super output areas in terms of as, as determined by the index of multiple deprivation. And um, yeah, there's a lot to say about that, uh, I, I guess, but that was the idea. So what, what happened when, when, you, when you first opened? 
When we well, we we found that the school attracted um, I mean the school the school was built in an, in a neighborhood that that did not think that the, it was for them to start with. We couldn't we couldn't even advertise um, the fact that the school was opening until five days before the closing date for uh, applications for um, reception and year one oh my god uh, primary thing but we we started um, so we, we we attracted a all kinds of really quite um, a very heterogeneous um, role uh, and and it developed in that way as well. But effectively, we were drawing children from about a, 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 a radius of about a mile, a mile to a mile and a half from the school. And we just saw some, at that point, there are 100 schools. I think the point about this project as well is the school grew in five years from 100 to 1,000. You know the scale of this project, the, the dynamics of it, is not something really that um, ha, you would you would choose to take on without very serious conviction about the importance of the pedagogical work that you're doing. But um, every every year, the school changed in scope, scale extent size staffing every single year for five years and, and um managing the scalability of that particular kind of ethos and culture was one challenge another challenge was um the in-year migration inward migration of pupils who had been dissuaded from continuing to attend other schools, largely because of behavioural issues. And so the school had a, an extraordinarily high number of uh, pupils with special educational needs, um, and actually with some quite, quite complex um, learning difficulties or behavioural issues, but it, it wasn't a special school. In, and it was never funded as a special school, but it was clearly viewed as a safe place for young young people whose parents had seen uh, that they simply couldn't manage, they couldn't um, they couldn't cope. Not just in one previous school, but often in two, three, or four previous schools environments. So. This, this, uh, so I guess at the at the uh, at the heart of that is fundamental issue of social justice, really, that we were um, we were addressing, and that was from the outset and from the point of application, part and parcel of the project, that it was um, about place making in that neighbourhood. So fantastic. So. Can you tell us a little bit about the results, about sort of the students? Did you get graduating students to move on to Plymouth? And we, we just about did. We, we had at least one year of pupils who progressed from year 11 at the school to the extended degree uh, programs at the college. And, I mean, they were... Um, they were extraordinary. Um, we had a delegation from Ulster. Uh, a group of people came over to look at what we were doing because they were planning uh, to develop a school um, in Northern Ireland. And um, the so, so they had to look around the school. We invited the pupils that had progressed from the school to our uh, pre-degree programs 
um, to join us for a sandwich over lunch and have a conversation with them. And I think that the delegation was completely bowled over by what they saw and what they heard, which was a series of very confident, highly articulate and discerning um, thinkers. Um, it, and they were kind of saying, well, uh, so now you're, you're, um, you were at school and now you're at college and that must be very different, mustn't it? And they sort of looked at each other and they said, well, the thing is, that's what our peer, our peers are saying, like everybody around us is saying, oh, it's completely different here to school, here being Plymouth College of Art. And they said, and we are thinking, no, it's not. <laughs> and, um, they were pressed on this. And they said, well, by the, the delegates, the Irish delegates, they said, well, so what, what's different? What's different about you and them? Um, and they basically, they, one of them said, I can't remember the exact words, but he said, they don't seem to know how to direct their own learning. Okay, so it was either that phrase exactly, or there was a different verb in there. But the, these were young people who, from the outset of their engagement with Plymouth School of Creative Arts, had, be, had understood that their job was to direct their own learning, that they weren't learning, they weren't there for some other purpose you know, that their job was not to double guess what the teacher wanted them to say. And there, what, the, the, there was a kind of ex, extraordinary quali quality uh, that I witnessed and, and that um, our visitors uh, were, cl were clearly mightily impressed with. But I guess the, I guess the point is, um, the wider point that this is a this was an utterly exceptional experience, um, and it's not the experience that learners have at many schools, and that's not surprising because we have an education system um, that is run on different principles and encourages different behaviours, and. Um, we have, you know, uh, two generations of people who are victims of that system. Brilliant. I mean, so after that, they, they, they changed the structure of the school or what happened? The, in England, there's, um, I guess, the, what I would say is the political dimension of the free school scheme which was the conservative Lib Dem coalition's extension of what lay, the lay, previous Labour administrations had begun as the academies program. Um, the, 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 an emerging priority seemed to be to accelerate the degree to which control of schools was being withdrawn from local authorities up and down the country. Our school worked with the local authority. We wanted to work with the local authority. Um, there were all sorts of reasons why you, would, you, you wouldn't want not to work with a local authority, but um, I guess there's an ideological uh, edge to that that came in. Um, where was I? Where was I going with that? So the, but but there's a there be, there was a tipping point where it was clear that the the kind of regulatory function uh, and the support function that local education authorities had provided for schools was disintegrating. Um, the more schools converted, state schools converted to academies. Um, 
so the proxy for uh, local authorities uh, that was invented was the multi-academy trust. So you know how multi-academy trusts running large clusters of schools or small clusters of schools. And there has been, uh, you know, a degree of pressure that manifests itself in all kinds of ways on state schools to become academies, on single academy trusts to become multi-academy trusts. And um, that's the backdrop. Um, our school was um, dealing with a series or some major structural issues, one of which had to do with the with, with noise attenuation in the building, and the other had to do with this massive incidence of inward migration of, pu of pupils with very, very high levels of need. Um, so, and the school was, was visibly struggling to cope with that mm -hmm. on the growth trajectory that I described earlier. And um, there was therefore very strong encouragement from uh, Ofsted and the Regional Schools Commission to uh, become part of a multi-academy trust. And that was a process that we brokered over uh, a couple of years. So the the project that I the the project did not fulfill um, its original um, aspirations um, in that sense and always was at variance with the prevailing um, ethos uh, and, polit and political ethos of the educational system. Um, and so, uh, but, but we move on, we move on in, in different terms. And the, the point that I guess matters most is that, that the, the wider, um, a wider applicability of this idea of the centrality of making as thinking in learning from early years onwards is is an issue that remains to be addressed and that has to do with curriculum but it has to do with pedagogy um it there are no um creative arts subjects in the uh ebac the english baccalaureate the the or um you know that is the basis on which school performance is measured. And so schools have pr progressively and rapidly marginalised and actually deleted creative arts subjects from the core curriculum. So there's an, arguably there isn't a broad and balanced curriculum these days in, with some fantastic exceptions, but broadly speaking, uh, in the same way that they used to, to be. Um, and an excessive focus on um, exam results as a proxy for learning achievement um, means that pedagogy is skewed, driven in, in particular ways that further miti mitigate against um, kind of approach to learning that I you know, have observed in art schools and was keen to foster more broadly in a cross-disciplinary uh, context. Brilliant. So would you say that if we were to do art and design education differently, would you say that as, as uh, primarily we would go back, we would go to the, to the schools, we would go to, to, to what you did? I mean, I think we. I think the Plymouth School of Creative Arts and Plymouth College of Arts is a case study. It will. It will be a case study for a different kind of approach, um, and an attempt to achieve a joined-up, progressive um, continuum of creative learning. You know, from early years onwards, and and. Um, But learning, learning that is not uh, pigeonholed as something other than 
the basic business and uh, the fundamental business and the basic purpose of living your life, especially in neighborhoods that experience uh, multiple disadvantage and deprivation. And I guess we, we sort of distilled this um, as a, you can't, you, the, there, isn't a, there isn't a public debate, there isn't a debate about this question um, at the moment. You, it's not possible to have a conversation with government, a serious, serious dialogue, as opposed to the sort of exchange ritual exchange of opposing ideas. Um, and the, our response to that was to, to go into propositional mode, to basically just develop a series of propositions, 10 propositions that distilled essential principles of learning that we believe um, aren't just applicable to art and design. Um, uh, they apply in all fields of learning. Um, and then you put the propositions out there and you see what happens and people are at liberty to, to agree and, and disagree um, as, violent, as violently as they feel um, uh, compelled to respond. And, um, but, but they are also guiding principles. They are kind of, they, they help decision-making. And the fundamental, the fundamental proposition is that making is as important as reading and writing, as important as science and mathematics. And the second, uh, the second proposition grows out of that, which is that making comes before knowing. So making is, is cognitive method. It's not just a technical exercise. It's making is a, 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 a way of apperceiving your experience. And um, in, in an art school context, um, you know, you, you tap an art student on the shoulder and you, you ask them what they do and what, what they're unlikely to say is I'm a student. They'll tell you I'm a fashion designer, I'm a filmmaker, a graphic artist. Um, art in that sense is not a subject. I think that's the art and design really is uh, not really a subject or it's about 30 different subjects. Um, art is a, 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 is a mode of thinking. It's, it's, a, it's a mode of creative intelligence that grows out of making, which is the signature of our, our species in a way. Um, and why would you ignore that? Why would you, um, why would you, cease to foster the development of that kind of human intelligence in future generations. It's a major omission in terms of investment, investment in our children. So art is not about life, it's about living. It's not a kind of secondary descriptive purpose, it's an, it's an act of live human intelligence and applies to just about every uh, every walk of life and I guess that's where in the context of this podcast I'm I don't really consider myself a design professional in a way I don't really consider myself a career academic but I am interested in these questions and I am interested in making uh, in this context the purpose of learning is inseparable from that of living your life i'm working my way through these propositions the purpose of learning is inseparable from that of living your life and purposeful learning creates agency 
not dependency in learners. So that um, um, that word agency is, is, is kind of sort of central to my thinking, my formation um, in the context of learning and, and professional practice. Are there more propositions for the, or? The, yeah. So uh, the purpose of learning is inseparable from that of living your life is number four. <laughs> Uh, and so in there is there is that there is that sense in which arts artists art students don't recognize that there is a difference between your creative practice and the rest of your life the whole thing is as much a a life choice as it is an educational choice and there is a sense um <clears throat> in terms in in terms of assessment that in art education, the learner, this is the fifth proposition, in art education, the learner has no subject to hide behind. Because it's you that is the central focus of the assessment in a fairly unique way, because the what's being assessed is not something that you are doing at arm's length, if you like. Um, you, you're in the frame in a way in which um, you're not at, a, at, a, at an academic remove, if you like. Um, of course, every learner is the center of the assessment. Um, and then the question is how, okay, how is that assessment framed? But in the creative arts, you are, present in a different kind of performative sense and in a sense in which you only really complete the learning through the assessment that's to say it's only when your work looks back at you that it's actually complete um so uh the, there are there are four more propositions and then the, the next two come back to the issue I spoke of earlier, which is around the space of learning. The sp space of learning offers or withdraws the possibility of learning. If you don't have certain kinds of learning environments, if you're, I'm talking about material environments, performance spaces, acoustic spaces, uh, technologies, then you can't develop the kind of learning that you might otherwise put on in that sense. But I guess the, the more interesting question around the space of learning is the fact that the space of learning is primarily an imaginal space. So what I'm talking about in terms of the studio, if you like, the, the space of learning in an art school is it's a theater of uh, interaction, but the, the central space of learning is, is your imagination. It's what's happening inside your head and uh, how what's happening inside your head corresponds with what's happening in the, the, the immediate uh, environment in which the learning takes place and against which horizons does that learning orientate itself. So space as a, as a construct fascinates me because space is an artifact. You know, the human experience of space is a human artifact. We don't have a perspective on the world from outside that world um, yet, not quite. Um, so space, the next proposition is that space cannot contain energy because it's it's energy that creates space. So the kinds of energies that I was very critical of in educational policy terms create the kind of schools that are the learning spaces in which then the space of learning offers or withdraws, withdraws the possibility of learning. But energy creates space is 
is the proposition. So art schools, you know, that's how they that's how they function. And 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 your job as the head of an institution is to keep that space open uh, and not close it down. Uh, as a learner, so the, the 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 propositions are iterative. The next one moves continues the space metaphor in a way, but the proposition is that as a learner, as an artist, your identity will come from the horizon, not from the boundary line. In other words, that your, your job is to go out into the world in order to discover who you are. And the drawing, drawing boundaries, drawing red lines, uh, becomes a form of imprisonment, self-imprisonment. And so that fascinates me in, at the level of individuals and at the level of neighborhoods and communities, cities, nations. Um, and, you know, it, <laughs> um, it's, that's clearly, that outward direction is, not, is clearly not the political choice uh, of the UK at the moment, um, where the lines are being drawn and redrawn and undrawn um, almost on an annual basis at the moment. So each of these propositions has resonance, I guess, beyond the business of education. That's the whole point. And the 10th proposition is perhaps the most important one. And that is, what's your proposition? Because that's the, that's the point of exchange. That's the point of engagement. Um, that will inform the way in which you're thinking. If you can't invite the other into the equation, if you don't have that sort, sort of dynamic between inside and outside, um, then you're, you're working in a closed circuit. So 10 propositions for creative learning and social justice. And in, in the context of Plymouth, um, each one of these propositions has a particular context, particular resonance, raises particular kinds of issues and questions. Um, in ways that have absorbed me for a very long time. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, I think you've answered all the questions <laughs> with, with, uh, <laughs> uh, with these. Uh, it's the application of values, of course, that you call energy, of course. You know, it's the values are driven. It's, uh, it's absolutely essential. I, I think also, also it's recognizing in the context of making that practically everything in human culture is some form of artifact. Language, identity, community, uh, are human artifacts. They, the least, the least, the less informed we are about making, the less we understand the nature of the artifact. And in a way that, in, in pedagogical terms, the ability to see the idea in the artifact and to see the artifact in the idea, um, you know, is one, is, is one of the, the key instruments of learning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, uh, how can our viewers find you? Sorry? How can our viewers and listeners find you? Oh, well, I'm, I, uh, as I say, I, I, I kind of made, I made a decision about five years ago that I would retire this year. And that process slightly delayed in terms of the challenges of coronavirus and, and whatnot. But, um, my, my thought was to create space in which I 
um, can start work really. <laughs> <laughs> the, the paradox is you have to give up your job in order to get some work done in, in, in one respect. And so I live, I don't live in Plymouth now. I, uh, I live in, the, in Shropshire in the Midlands, in the Welsh border country. Um, I, I guess I, I am Professor Emeritus at Plymouth College of Art. I still have a, that kind of formal link. I have links... Um, two colleagues in China very much in Shanghai as a honorary professor at Shanghai University and at the Shanghai Academy of Fine Art. Um, so in terms of finding me, I'm on, I don't know, I'm not sure how to answer the question. I guess through well, social you're media. LinkedIn. You're on LinkedIn, yeah. You're sort of... I, I, I'm on LinkedIn, that's right. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. Uh, but these are some kind of the LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. It's I was sort of very wary of, and I don't spend much time in. I don't. I'm not an active member of any of those communities. It's just that it became a way of keeping in touch with what the what the poetry world is doing and what the educationalists are thinking and. And you know uh, what my kids are up to. Um, so there are various ways of of getting in touch. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a question I hadn't thought about, but uh, here I am. <laughs> so, what advice would you like to leave us with? I'm not sure that I'm. I'm not sure that I'm the best advisor you, you could, seek you could refer to. But I, I guess, um, I guess it comes back to purposeful living. Um, and. Staying true to various, I mean, it's cliche, isn't it? Staying true to various values, doing the thing that you love. It has to do with respect for the other. The, I'm, I'm talking about values. Yeah. Um, education, um, you know, get yourself educated don't stop learning learning i so I'm, i'm i'm narrowing this down i think i think my advice is um approach learning uh as a life project um make it work for you and others um Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I haven't. Um, I don't have any stock ans answers for, for for that question in a way. But but that seems to me to be pretty damn fundamental um, in all of this. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, fantastic conversation, and uh, looking forward to the education forum in uh, November. So it's fantastic. Thanks, Left Terrace, and thank you everybody for your your time. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.